but thank I will you. start first uh, by uh, thanking you for, uh, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here to open an important center of a good friends with the most important people and friends in our community. Uh, well, my talk will be actually very broad, so considering that for well, the broad public. And of course, we all hear about robotics uh, uh, when a lot of questions are going around, and most of them very often are due to disinformation. And, uh, and, uh, but robotics will have as certainly an important role uh, in the time to come. There is a, a very nice, um, uh, there are a couple of very nice video genius of uh, Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times, in which are kind of fantasizing about the stupidity of certain manual jobs and uh, some uh, uh, ideas about robotics and automation in care. Well, the reality, of course, is, is here. Uh, as shown many times in the morning, a lot of the cars we, we are uh, building are all done by, 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 by robots. And there are you know, very nice developments in robotics care, for example, to robots that will help people in different ways. But as long as I'm concerned, one thing is certain. As I say, physics predicts the future, and robotics will create it for us. But uh, what about artificial intelligence? Uh, I would like to recall a statement of uh, uh, an distinguished uh, colleague uh, of ours in 88 from Stanford, and uh, it was Moravec, and he, he actually mentioned this paradox, which I think, I mean, it was stated in 88, but I think it's still a fact, uh, that it is comparatively easy to make computer exhibit adult level performance on intelligent tests of playing checkers, or Go, nowadays, and difficult or impossible to give them the skills of a one-year-old when it comes to perception and mobility. And this, I think, is a crucial thing that is very often forgotten by the general public in general. So, of course, uh, artificial intelligence is extremely important and it's, it goes hand in hand with robotics. Even if people very, very often you know, use the two terms interchangeably, which is not correct. And uh, uh, Antonio showed very nice uh, uh, hand, I think the nicest around there. And I want to show you to you something that you may have seen before, which is a cortical homunculus. Basically, if you take a, a, a man and you scale uh, his parts of the body on the basis of the volumetric uh, size uh, of the brain cortex, which is used to move that part of the body, you see that for a man, uh, you have very big hands, right? So that really supports what it was said so far, that you know humans are probably got so far in evolutions because of their hands. And uh, therefore, you know, the big challenges in robotics is really the combination of the two. It's not just the artificial intelligence, the perception and cognitions that makes a lot of things possible, but also the manipulation in broad sense of the word is really uh, uh, crucial and, and very hard. So I think that the real big challenges that actually we are facing are going to be in the intersection between the two. Uh, so basically using of what is called here physical artificial intelligence, but it's been named in different ways, uh, uh, is basically this combination of understanding the multimodal interactions and the perceptual uh, um, cues that, that you have. And in order to, to show that, I mean, some things have been shown before, but I would like to show you these two things. Well, what you see, uh, we are not very close of doing what these guys do, at least I am not for sure. Uh, and robots, you know, we have seen nice robots around, but this is pretty amazing. And this is, we are not going to see this in, in a few days to come. Uh, at the same time, uh, we'll talk about bursts at the end. What you see on the right side, think about the nature and the flexibility and the softening of the birds and their wings. If you take the fastest plane, which is a blackbird, the SR-71, it has a speed of 32 body lengths per second, okay? A normal Swift is actually has a speed of 140 body lengths per second, okay? So if you compare that as, not as a total speed, but the speed with respect to the length, it's pretty amazing what nature can do with respect to the best plane we have. If we do look at, at, the, at the roll rates of planes, the most agile planes that there is now is the Douglas A4, the Skyhawk, and it has a 70, 720 degrees per second roll rate, but uh, a normal barn swallow, which is in a, in a, in a theology is called Irundo rusticus, is 5,000 degrees per second. Okay, and this is really gives an impression of how complex the physical interaction is, and uh, and 
uh, Sang Bei showed amazing uh, steps uh, in, in this direction before. There is also another thing which I think is very important for us as a community, and as actually was touched by, by Cecilia before, is that I think that when we are getting to situations in which we have to deal with safety, moral, or legal consequences, we have to create an engineer system in a way that things do not get, when they get out of that, let's say, not deterministic or well-defined settings that AI can give you, there should be an engineering models that can to kick in and be sure that certain things are followed. So my idea and vision on how the future will be is that I think the deployment of robotics AI will basically be in two phases. The first phase, and it's now, now is pure speculation, 30, 40, 50 years, in which we will have a lot of cool technology coming out and, and humans will collaborate. There is no displacement of jobs at all. Uh, and uh, we will create the future for the phase which will come next, in which uh, basically you know, we will be so far that we will have humanoids with artificial intelligence going around and doing things for us. But then, you know, everything will be changed. And it's not just a technological issue, the, our society economics will be changed. And this is actually was mentioned by, by Cecilia. This is a very important point to think about, start thinking about now. It's far away, I will be dead very likely by then. But for my children and our future generation, this is something that has to be planned far ahead on time because when we'll be so far, we'll be too late if we don't take actions. But I'm not afraid of that. I think that I really I want to cite this nice sentence of George Bernard's show that actually was used by um, Robert Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald Kennedy, that people, you know, sometimes, you know, they are um, afraid of things, but why, why not looking at the future with a positive attitude? I think that for our community, there is a lot to be, to, to be uh, achieved, eh? new control strategies, new actuators, new materials, new performer measures, because robot is going to change drastically, and safety, of course, will become uh, a major issue. Uh, very briefly, where I'm coming from, University of Twente may not be known to you, is a campus university in the Netherlands. It's a young, reasonably young university. And uh, we have uh, the only campus which has a Fraunhofer uh, in the Netherlands and a Max Planck on fluids uh, and uh, a lot of spin-offs. You certainly know Booking.com. Well, you may not, didn't, probably didn't know that it was a spin-off of Twente. Uh, which was then sold for a lot of money. And this guy actually recently announced to open a, a research center on batteries, uh, which called Lithium Works, uh, with uh, 2,000 people, and is starting building in January 2020. Uh, this is a very a glimpse. I will not talk. These are the things we are working in, in, in our lab. And I just want to show you some of the things. I will uh, mostly talk about the bird in the coming in the last minutes, but we've been working in MRI-compatible robotics. We have the smallest MRI-compatible robots out there, and we have been working on, on actuators also together in a very nice project was coordinated by, by Antonio, and, and uh, many other things that you may be interested if you can do, talk about during the lunch. I want just briefly then make a step forward to what I call energy-aware robotics. It's a very wrong conception. It was mentioned by somebody before that passivity is restrictive. Passivity in the very strong way of the word may be restrictive. That's why I talk about energy-aware robotics, not about passivity. But energy is what plays the role in, in all kinds of interactions. So as um, Wittgenstein says, uh, well, I think that to talk about robotics and soft compliant interaction uh, impacts, Clearly, we must use the right tools in the language. As long as I'm concerned, I strongly believe that uh, you really look at, need to look at the physics, you need to look at what, I, what is in the setting of work, is called port-based energy-aware methods. Uh, so basically, just to give an intuition of what we're talking about, is if you think about humans, uh, and you, you think about the muscles and the brain, basic motorics, the deduction and cognition, which is more in the brain, uh, you would, muscles, what muscles do is really, it has been shown a lot of compliance is very important interaction. There's no way to do proper interaction if you don't have compliance. So this structure basically to def, def, uh, decompose a kind of supervisor with an intrinsically passive control of energy aware control, I should actually call it, which interacts with the environment is fundamentally important. And in, uh, for example, when in 97 I did something about grasping on, on, on uh, 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 on this idea, which is very much related to also what uh, uh, Antonio was saying, that of course when you grasp you need to go inside the object itself. And this has been successfully implemented uh, by DLR in many different situations. 
And uh, my slogan is port based, uh, port based inside. And Antonio makes fun of me all the time, but that's the way I think about it. <laughs> so uh, just think about an analogy in humans. So what you have is, of course, you have a, a robotic mechanism, which would be a skeleton. And then you have the muscles, which basically couple the skeleton to something you can basically achieve motion with. And together with a kind of impenist units of these muscles, uh, you basically recompose the muscular system. Then, of course, all these muscles are connected to the spine, to, to, to the CPGs. There are a lot of models in order to talk about that. And the dynamic compensation and, uh, and relations is what is basically resemble the uh, um, neural systems. And then, of course, you have the supervisions in this paradigm I mentioned, which is basically the brain, and all these things about learning plays a major role down there. What is nice is that now we are working uh, together with, with Sami Adani and Neville Hogan on, on something on a paper which what we very likely will call behavioral synergy instantiation, which is basically to, de to compose behaviors for various applications and to put this in these total frameworks. And in all the situations, energy will be properly handled because you are dealing at the end of the day with an environment which is by definition never known. This theory is based around these topics. We, we brought out a book at the end of a project I coordinated, which is called Geoplexis, uh, and this book basically handled and introduced all this theory, which is all about energy flows. And one of the things I basically uh, uh, worked recently is, I, I like to mention this conjecture, which says that to ensure stability during any interaction with an environment which is non known a priori by definition, Control needs to be implemented by interconnection. So if you build a system and you put a spring somewhere, the system will not get unstable, right? Because it's interconnecting a spring to a physical system. So the idea is basically by control, even if you do it in the digital world, you will like to resemble this idea. And along this line, actually, uh, I will not describe it, but you can formally prove that indeed there is a basis to believe that this is the way to go. And uh, uh, once again, I will not go to the theory, just show you that with a very simple idea, if you just take a, a very simple control system, MPD kind of controller, 30 hertz, and you do it normally, it would get unstable, but if you use this idea, it would perfectly be stable. And one thing that actually we were dis uh, discussing just before the break with the Sangbei, one of the crucial things that you have, if you have an architecture in which you have a lot of time delays, uh, between the various actuators which control the mechanism, which interacts with the environment, and a control which could be at a supervisory level, and you may have a lot of time delays, there is a very nice way to actually tackle this in a perfectly 100% uh, 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 stable way. And this is something that we are working on within the context of the project SoftPro, which is coordinated by uh, Antonio. <coughs> Now, as Einstein said, logic will get you from A to B, imagination will take you everywhere. And this is what I want to close my uh, lecture with, which is the beauty of flight. Um, you know, Leonardo da Vinci already in, in uh, 1500 uh, was actually fantasizing about building machines that took cool fly. And uh, of course, if you look at these uh, wonderful uh, videos, you see how amazing is flight, certainly of birds. It's much more complicated, as I mentioned before, than any uh, flight of normal planes. We have a bird, we built a bird, which it's about the same weight, uh, size, and flapping frequency as a peregrine falcon, and which can actually fly 80 kilometers an hour and at five before wind. So this can fly, this can fly in, in a lot of wind. There are other birds that cannot fly out, so outdoor. If there is a bit of wind, they get unstable. This one flies up in very uh, heavy condition of wind. And uh, I will show you a video more, a video later. And we got a tech transfer award with this and the cover and the award of Robotics and Automation magazine. We are very happy about it. The issue that uh, we don't really still understand exactly what's going on. This is a CFD, so computational fluid dynamics of what is happening in the flow in 2D. So if you take a, take, take a section of the wing, you basically can see that you generate vortices that crazy are in, in, inverted. That's called what is called a, a reverse von Karman sheet generation, which is very much related to a, a, a number, a quantity in fluid dynamics that basically characterizes this kind of procedure. But this explains a lot because all uh, 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 flapping uh, animals, also uh, fishes, 
actually uh, always uh, uh, get around this number, uh, between a number of 0 0.2 and 0 0.4. One thing which is, we haven't clarified yet, is that if we make the wings very stiff, same size, same flapping, uh, flapping frequency, but you see that these, our wings deform. If you notice here, they really deform in the downstroke. And this is fundamental to have a 3D generation of the vortices, because without that, actually, it does not work. And this is why we, uh, I'm very happy that now I will be able to, to, uh, to work on this in, in these port wing projects. And the way I want to tackle this is basically in the following way, by using this port idea I just introduced before. So basically, you will see the, the, the body of the bird is like a rigid body, and you have the wings. And the wings will be connected by these energy bonds that will, will uh, be characterized using these settings I didn't describe. And the same will be for the wings. But of course, the cool, heavy stuff it actually comes here. And it comes between the interaction between the fluid, fluid dynamics of the air around the wings and the motion of the wing, which are deformable, as I said. So you are working, you have to deal with partial differential equations. Uh, and uh, we, in which the boundaries of these uh, wings are also moving in, within, within the flow. And there is some, I mean, uh, uh, this interaction with the body uh, just uses uh, uh, pretty standard, I would say, uh, um, a structure which is called Lie groups, or the finite dimensional Lie groups. But when you go about talking about the interaction of this PDE, you, get, you need to use a lot of new math, which uses actually differential forms and modules, not vector spaces, which basically model the, 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 the deformation of the wings. To conclude, I just want to show you a video which I showed friends a couple of times, which gives you an idea of what this bird can do. Working in aviation, waste management or agriculture, one knows that birds can be of great nuisance. Birds spread diseases, pick up waste and pollute the surroundings. Nothing, however, tops the risk of bird strikes in aviation. Clear Flight Solutions has the answer to your problems. The Rowbird. The Rowbird is an environmentally friendly solution for all your bird-related problems. It is a flapping wing robotic bird that not only looks like a bird of prey, but also flies like one. We have many years of experience in unmanned aviation and bird control. Our certified pilots are experts in flying our rowbirds. As safety is paramount, fly our rowbirds are equipped with state-of-the-art autopilots, GPS and geofence systems. We make sure that the pilot in command is always in control. The instinctual behavior of birds when confronted with a predator is flocking together for maximum safety. By flying around the flock, the pilot can remove the birds lastingly in the direction of choice. Shortly after this, birds will start to recognize the area as a territory of prey and will start avoiding it. By mimicking nature, Clear Flight Solutions creates a unique bird control system that birds will never get used to. We make sure your skies stay clear. Of course, it's a company. And then uh, they would like to conclude by saying that the best way to predict the future is to create it. And with this, I would like to wish Sami a lot of success in his new adventure. And I'm really looking forward to collaborate with him in the paper I mentioned in Different Thing. And even if some animals still have, have to adapt, uh, I think that the sky is not the limit, the last, just the first layer. Thank you very much for your attention.